but unlike many electronic computers, the biological computer brain of a robotoid possesses an enormous memory. As a result, robotoids can be programmed to communicate and think in such complex patterns that they act human. They also have a very limited lifespan, measured in months or even weeks depending upon how they are utilized. This is due to the fact that their metabolism, while it resembles that of humans, is very inefficient. A robotoid can be manufactured on very short notice, a matter of hours, but after a few weeks or months it suddenly begins to degenerate physically and mentally. When that takes place, the robotoid has to be removed from service and disposed of. To produce an organic robotoid it is necessary to have a pattern to go by. The pattern required is that of genetic coding taken from a few cells from the body of a human being. In this respect the Russian technique sounds like cloning, but the technique itself is totally unrelated to genuine cloning. A robotoid is produced within a matter of hours and it simulates the human donor at his current age. Like any man-made copy of anything, a robotoid is never a perfect copy of the human that is to be simulated. There's always small discrepancies in appearance and behavior, but these are seldom great enough to arouse any suspicion. Last month I revealed that the Russians can manufacture organic robotoids which are almost exact carbon copies of real human beings. When an organic robotoid is made to simulate, for example, our late President Jimmy Carter, two major factors are involved. One is the genetic coding required to simulate Carter's appearance, voice, fingerprints, and so on. The other is a holographic image of Carter's brain. This image is a complete record of the neuron patterns which existed in Carter's brain at the moment the hologram was made. Therefore, it contains all of the memory and knowledge Carter had up to that moment. As a result, a Carter robotoid will automatically do certain kinds of things without the need for specific programming. For example, a Carter robotoid will seem to recognize old friends. That's because the computer memory of the robotoid reproduces Carter's memory of that friend. The holographic process puts it there automatically without the Russian programmers even having to know it's there. Robotoids can be programmed for self-preservation, but they are equally willing, if willing is the word, to perform suicide missions, exploratory one-way trips into space are only one example of this. If a space mission looks too dangerous to risk the life of an experienced cosmonaut, a robotoid can now be used. The robotoid copy of the cosmonaut is already trained the moment it's made thanks to its holographic memory. Good morning, Sam. Do you want me to cut your hair then? Lunar Industries remains the number one provider of clean energy worldwide due to the hard work of people like you. <laughs> Three years is a long haul, you know. I know you're really lonely up there, but I'm proud of you. Two weeks to go, Sam. Two weeks to go, buddy. I'm going home. Looks like we got a live one. I'm gonna go out. Okay, Sam. imagining things.
side, Matt Lauer and Al Roper. Will someone do the, the junior high hockey game? It's like this. You gotta make it real awkward. That's exactly how you have to have a certain amount of distance between the bodies and junior high. Yes, like they say in Catholic school, leave room for the Holy Ghost. Anyway, there is a lot of memories today. Actually, it's a big day in music history. Thirty-five years ago today, Elvis Presley passed away, the king of rock and roll. And as Mark Cohn says in his great song, Walking in Memphis, there's a pretty little thing waiting for the king down in... Why do you and the president have such a hyper-partisan view of politics? <laughs> well, Chris, if you had uh, walked even a day in our shoes over the last 15 years, I'm sure you'd understand. Now let me ask you about health care yeah, because you did, you, did come out, you, you did come up with a new plan this week, which you say would uh, ensure I the did. 47 million. Thank you so much for joining us today. Don't be a stranger and please send my best to the president. <laughs> I'm sure he'll be happy to hear that, Chris. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Terry Moran. Las Vegas, Sin City, there's no place like it. Casinos, showgirls, bright lights, high rollers, and glitzy nightlife. But Vegas is struggling through the recession, just like every other American city, maybe worse there. And beneath that famous strip of luxury hotels lies a bizarre and dark underworld. A community, literally off the grid, connected by miles of tunnels. And for the people you are about to meet, those tunnels have become home. As Nightline contributor Lisa Ling now reports. Las Vegas. It's the kind of place where few things provoke surprise anymore. But beneath the flashing lights, there's an even darker side of Sin City. We're about to descend into a secret world, a city beneath a city. Yeah, this gives you kind of a good idea of the tunnels and where they go and uh, what's above them. I mean, these four tunnels here, about eight feet wide and Matthew O'Brien has agreed to lead us here. through a labyrinth of tunnels here that stretch for miles. Goes under New York, New York. Goes under MGM Grand, one of the biggest hotels in the world. Goes about two and a half miles total to the Hard Rock, and it opens up at that point. But uh, so there's a whole world essentially existing beneath the Las Vegas Strip. Uh, exactly. Yeah, there's hundreds of people who live in these underground flood channels. And as we can feel, it's a lot cooler than outside, too. That's part of the attraction for, it's a for refuge. people to live. We followed Matt deeper into the tunnels and found a dark underworld. Yeah, I've been exploring these tunnels for more than seven years. You still have a bit of an anxiety going into the tunnels because you never know what to expect and you never know what's waiting in the dark. By the way, the only reason we can see right now is because of our flashlights and the light from the camera, because otherwise it's pitch black in here. By now, we're about a half a mile into a tunnel that runs just beneath Caesar's Palace, a major landmark on the Strip. It's eerily quiet, even though thousands of people are on the street above us. This is uh, kind of a, a garbage area and a bathroom. You can see the stains on the wall and the tissue on the ground and stuff. So we'll go through here and go up this side tunnel and see if we can see if anyone's around. Wow, this is wild. It's not long before someone hears us. Steve, oh good. What's going on? It's about to come find you. So we'll so just we'll follow, follow you, Steve. Steve okay. Yeah. Steve, you're not using you're not using a flashlight. You can navigate pretty well in here. Yeah, well, I, I've been down here for a while, so I, I can actually navigate without lights pretty much. Steve can uh, see in the dark, almost. Steve leads us to the home he shares with his fiance, Catherine. Still wet down here. Yeah, man. This is amazing. Hi, how are you? How are you? Hi, I'm um, Lisa. Can we come in? They've worked hard to make it as homey as possible. This is our shower. Pretty clever. Yeah, works just fine. A little privacy, you know, just put the curtain up. Steve says that like most tunnel dwellers, drugs landed him here. But Catherine threatened to leave him if he didn't quit. We fell in love and, you know, I mean, we want to get out of here. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's always our main goal. You know, we don't want to live like this forever. We don't like living in the tunnel. Um, we live here because, you know, it's, we can and we're not, we're not bothered by the, anybody, the police or anything like that, don't really know that we're down here. You know, it's a lot of out of sight, out of mind. Can you just turn off the light for a second? Because I just want to show how, show how dark it is in here. 
Steve introduced us to some of their neighbors in the tunnel. They're a community. So this is your home, huh? This is my home. Living next door is Phil. When we met him, he was reading Sports Illustrated, catching up on the latest scores. I, I bet sports or whatever with some of the money that I make, they're thinking that I'm going to hit it rich and you know get out of the situation. But everybody that comes to Vegas thinks the same thing I'm thinking. Is it weird that you kind of live in this world underneath yeah, it was at first. It was at first, but now once I once I see the call, I have to say the culture we created really. Um, no, I don't think it's. I don't think it's weird. I think it's. I think we were pretty smart to survive the way we did.